All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. If you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, uh, you can check us out at youtube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final products on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues uh, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And if you have any comments during the live tape, uh, during the live taping, you can let us know in the show's feedback page on the Facebook group, uh, or you can uh, just send me a f Facebook message and I'll certainly get to it. And uh, my guest tonight is Sheppy Morgan. Hey, how's it going? Doing all right. How about you? Very good. So uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, like gay marriage and marriage licenses in general and uh, why the Supreme Court is trying to keep out of it, or at least my guess. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, human evolution uh, and versus tribalism uh, and versus tradition, you know, uh, uh, how change can actually be a threat to the norm and um, how uh, people have an emotional reaction towards these changes. Um, uh, how that holds us back as a society or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about all this kind of stuff. So uh, let's just start with that, I guess. Um, the, the first part, the uh, gay marriage and marriage licenses. And my thing is uh, very simplistic. Licenses of any sort are uh, permission. And um, I think it's, uh, yeah, so it's a, uh, um, you're asking authority or illegitimate authority to do something that you should freely be able to do no matter what. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a car license or a, um, or a license to drive or a hair styling license. They have that in Louisiana and other places. And, um, but, uh yeah, what, what do you think of that on a very basic level? Well, honestly, I don't think that there's any need for any sort of licensing. Whether authority is valid or not, it's pretty stupid, if you ask me. Like, uh, really, there's nobody who's more qualified to answer whether you should do something other than yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, to be specific in uh, this instance, uh, we have the uh, gay marriage, um, you know, that whole issue. Um, and right. frankly, well, yeah, frankly, uh, gay men, gay women should be able to get married as they please. Um, and, uh, the, you know, basically the states should be staying out of... Uh, marriages altogether, no matter what. Oh, yeah. um, the reason why the Supreme Court is staying out of it is precisely because the government should be staying out of it, I think. Well, I, I so, don't know if that's you know, the reason the Supreme Court is staying out of it. Honestly, I think that they have... They, they want to keep a good image. And if they go one way or another... They're either going to have really conservative Christians really angry with them or homosexuals really angry with them. And, you know, if they weigh in on the issue, it's not going to look good for them. Well, yeah, it's not going to look good, and it's not, um, it's not right. You know, it's not right to... Oh, sorry. Um, it's... Uh, they should be staying out of it anyway, is what I'm saying. Like, uh, you're you're right. Maybe it is just an image thing, and uh, but really, do they're in the end doing the right thing? Uh, oh, yeah. you know, like, the the thing is, if all states uh, took all of those laws off the books, then basically you'd have a free market, and people will be doing what they will, and people will 
get married, whether they're gay or straight, and that's how it should be, really. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, honestly, I, I don't think that the reason these people, the reason homosexuals want to get married is because it, because the institution of marriage is kind of a religious thing. It's just, you know, states attach certain rights to the whole idea of being married. So, you know, gay people want to have the ability to have those marriage rights, the same ones that would come with a marriage, that, you know, straight people would. But if we got the state out of marriage altogether, I don't think there would be a huge flux of gay people getting married, quote unquote. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, when Massachusetts passed the law to uh, allow gay marriage or whatever, uh, there it was uh, kind of a big deal here. Um. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess it's almost like if, um, um, like when um, weed was allowed in Massachusetts, um, it, the use of it kind of died down a little bit, but people knew of it more. You know right. what I mean? Um. Is that what you think would you would see? Is that that what you're talking about? I, I, I don't know if it it would be more I I kind of have a negative uh, opinion of marriage in general. But uh understood. Um like I I, I really don't know. Um Yeah. I mean, if we saw the government get out of marriage completely, I'm not exactly sure what would happen. But um, yeah, because like you said, it's a religious thing, and yeah. I guess in a well, truly, statism is a religion, and so if we pull back the curtain on both ends, then maybe we'll see no ma or much less marriage because. It, um, people wouldn't be believe per se in religion and then marriage because that it is an institution. It's a, in a sense, it's a form of control. Right. As well, yeah. So I I get what you're saying. Maybe people will like just open their eyes up in a way. Is that what you're saying? Perhaps that, and you know, really, um, what what's more of a commitment? saying that, you know, because we made these bonds, I'm going to stay with you, or staying with somebody just because they're great or because you really love them. Right. I mean, yeah. and you I, I really don't see any reason that atheists or non-statists would get married aside from, you know, the whole state right thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can actually kind of uh, scoot into uh, the idea of tradition and tribalism and evolution, actually. We can talk about that right now. Um, I guess I've been thinking about this for about 24 hours, not too hard, um, but uh, as people uh, gather knowledge and develop their skills and their, you know, everything, uh, they end up uh, having ideas that are outside the norm and you become outcast. Uh, people try to, um, just because of your thoughts, not so much the way you, your personality uh, they try to outcast the thought and um, deviant behavior. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, if you think that democracy is a good thing, when 
uh, you have a monarchy, you know, that's outside the realm of possible ideas. So right. we have to, you know, shun this person and throw rocks at him. Um, uh, you know, and with our mindset, you know, we're shunned. We're considered chaotic. We're considered, um, you know, basically these are all just emotional reactions and no real meaning behind it. You know, uh, they try to formulate a, um, a thesis, but all they can do is, in the end, uh, call names, you know. Right. Um, so it's basically how religion works. <laughs> and it's basically, you know, like, um, you know, steadfast religion, you know, uh, the way uh, we see it right now, uh, the hierarchical, um, hierarchical, and um, uh, that's how statism works as well. And, you know, so I guess, uh, yeah, let's start there. Uh, what, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, a lot of human behavior is steeped in religious tradition. And we really, as a species, need to break away from that because it's just going to close our minds off to new possibilities, new ideas, things that could progress us as a species beyond our, you know, rigid hierarchical society. Yeah, um, I mean, it's all, it's all due to fear. Like, everything um, that we know as a society, uh, we're told it, and... Uh, we there's a they instill fear inside of you in order to obey uh, these leaders who should in theory um, be our um, servants but of course that's not how government works mm -hmm. uh, yeah like they, they try to control you through fear and uh, tradition and it's basically a tribal mindset Oh, it's definitely, you know, tribalism uh, uh, multiplied. Like, instead of the tribe of 100 to 150 people, we've got this tribe of 300 million. And uh, it's us against them. It's this whole us against them mentality that keeps that whole structure in place. Without that mentality, the whole thing collapses. Yeah. Um, I was asked um, in anarchism, would there be a place for religion? Um, uh, would it exist at all? I think that there will be some people that would still subscribe to religion and uh, other forms of worship, as it were. And and so I think it would exist. the The question is, will some churches try to use force against others? Um, they'll probably try to sort of brainwash um, its members, but I don't think that it would be legitimate to exist if it were to use force on other people outside of it. Well, it, it, it basically, on the doctrine of religion itself, like, um, there's the the majority of people are religious as it is now, and like, there are people who you know believe in the use of force to convert people, if not convert, you know, just kill them because they're infidels or heretics or whatever. Um, I'm sure that there would be people who would use force, but in an anarchic, anarchistic society, it would be a lot harder for them to do so because there would be more people who would be willing to resist them outright. Right. I mean, uh, the thing is, we're, um, you know, on this now, Work that we have, uh, voluntary virtues. I know there are 
uh, some that are religious and uh, do not subscribe to the use of force at all. And that's how I was brought up, honestly, was um, I was in a Protestant church. <clears throat> and I think there was a little bit of um, control, a little bit. Not too bad, though. I got the impression of liberty, basically. You know, like, um, you know, you, you know, the Ten Commandments or whatever. Um, I don't subscribe to all of those commandments or whatever, but I'm just saying um, that there is a little bit of liberty in the um, in their teachings. Uh, oh, yeah. So I mean, that's how I got to know liberty when I was a kid. But then you know, it's taken out of you in school, and then well, I eventually came back to it. You know, so thankfully. But I'm just saying that there are some people that know how to separate the good from the bad in uh, the Bible or other teachings and uh, religion, um, structured religion or whatever. You know, if you've got a little bit of spirituality, um, I don't think that's necessarily religion. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Well, people are going to believe what they're going to believe. There's really no change. People. I mean, the only thing that you can do is try and use logic and reason to get them to think about the world. Um, I mean, there's really no right answer to anything. Um, yeah, I get that. Yeah, like, um, if, uh, if you're brought up a certain way, I guess uh, it's hard to convince someone to break out of that. Um, but they, you know, in every case, you have to come to uh, the realization, the reality yourself, um, and hopefully you were brought up the right way, you know, to keep an open mind, per se. Um, that's liberty anyway. <laughs> right. Um, basically, it all, all boils down to, you know, being able to accept things that you might not understand yet as, you know, possible, possibly valid, you know. You just have to be able to uh, yeah, keep that open mind. Yeah. Yeah. Move on to uh, something completely different, uh, and that's economics. Okay. Uh, so I want to talk about um, kind of following up on uh, the Federal Reserve uh, from last time, Federal right. Reserve, the income tax, all of that. Uh, we were talking about inflation, uh, how it destroys the dollar, and we also talked about how poorly silver and gold and Bitcoin were all doing. And um, I kind of want to follow up on that. Uh, today I was looking at the charts for silver and gold. And they went up pretty consistently all day. Um, uh, Bitcoin was doing that yesterday as well. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I... I recently uh, was given uh, some Bitcoin for some services, and oh. uh, wow. I've just been watching their value. But uh, hmm. yeah, um, over the last uh, week or so, it's been on a pretty steady downward trend. But yesterday, it went up a little bit. So I haven't checked it out again today. But perhaps yeah. uh, you know the whole quantitative easing thing is starting to rear its ugly head. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of part of it. Um, well, I mean, there's a big manipulation going on. I'm not sure about how that would work with Bitcoin, uh, but I do know uh, silver and gold. I, I'm pretty sure that this is the end of that downward trend. Like, um, it, it was amazing. Like, September... 
over the last four years, uh, silver and gold went up quite a bit. Oh yeah. And except for this year, what's up? Oh yeah, it, it was on a downward spiral for almost the entire uh, 2014 year. Well, yeah, well, during the summer, it was pretty stable. Um, but, yeah, all I'm saying is over the last four Septembers, September, you know, last month, over the those last four Septembers, it went up. So this is the first time it went down uh, it, that I know of. Um, so I think something is really like fishy I mean uh, you know I'm thinking that anyway obviously because I'm pretty sure it's being manipulated anyway but oh. um, it, it, it's just been really weird like this September and now I feel like it's just gonna go through the roof not not explode explode but I feel like it's going to you know probably reach 50 plus you know what I mean I wouldn't be surprised. Um, yeah. Like uh, two years ago, it was like what, 35, 40? And yeah. I mean, they've been printing God knows how much money, like just uncountable amounts. Yeah, and people are defaulting on loans. And so that's destroying the currency. Basically, because of those defaults, like back in, what was it, 2008, 2009, and, you know, people are still defaulting, and they're trying to say, you know, like the media and everything is trying to say that, you know, we've recovered and everything. Well, yeah. they are, too. Right. Like, <laughs> within months after the housing crisis, they were like, oh, the, the economy is on an upward swing, you know, and... Anybody who knows anything about economics knew that was total bull, but they yeah. they like to, you know, project this image that, you know, the government's doing its job, but the government never does its job because its job isn't actually to regulate an economy because that's impossible outside of actual you know, market, yeah. uh, you know, mechanisms. Right, it's unnatural. Uh, an economy by force, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, it's not its job. Its job is to protect itself. That's mm -hmm. what the government is. Um, yeah, I uh, I think that what I'm going to see is uh, big jumps in all three, uh, silver, gold, Bitcoin, and all kinds of other things. Um, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I know that uh, we're, or the Federal Reserve is still trying to pay gold and silver off to China, but I'm pretty sure that that day is over because we, you know, the silver price compared to demand and supply, you know, if you think about it, it's just out of whack. And um, yeah, it, it's over. You know, like we're gonna see prices probably skyrocket. You know, for the lack of a better term. Well, um, you know, maybe the uh, silver prices, the silver and gold prices going down remaining stable for so long could be because you know the US government's been emptying their reserves and all that silver that wasn't on the market before you know suddenly became available for purchase so you know supply went up and when demand doesn't go higher and supply rises prices go down well uh, I feel like that's exactly what's going on is the, it's got to be manipulated, and I say that because uh, if the Federal Reserve is selling its assets off to China, then 
that means that there's less in our supply, so the demand um, or the supply is going down. I think. Does that make sense? Because China, well, if what, what, they want what stuff, then they're going to hold it. Their, what is China doing with their uh, precious metal reserves? They're making a gold-backed currency, which you know means that they're putting gold out into the market. Putting silver, they're probably selling that silver. And that's putting silver out into the market. So while, you know, the cash is continuously being printed, like silver and gold could go, go down if there's more gold and silver being pumped into the market. I, did they actually put that currency out? I'm not sure. I, I read about that several months ago. I, I assumed so, but I'm not really sure on that. I don't think I've heard of that. Cool. Because then that would be good. Well, yeah, it, it would be good, but uh, I don't know. It a lot of uh, you know statist economists think it's an awful idea because it'll destroy the destroy the dollar. But this the dollar has already destroyed itself. I don't see that. Uh, but that was Wikipedia, so you can't trust it totally. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, always search for multiple sources. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. I'll look into that. Basically, I think that the U.S. dollar is probably going to be done for within the next five years because yeah. they keep printing like this. Like, there's no way. To, to avoid hyperinflation. As yeah. soon as those dollars, you know, make it into the regular economy, like, prices for everything are just going to skyrocket. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I mean, I'm not a big fan of minimum wage laws, but they do exist. And, uh, you know, our government isn't really big on keeping those up with inflation. So, you know, seven, I, I don't even know what the minimum wage is now. It's like seven twenty-five, seven seventy-five. But uh, when the dollar decreases in value, you know, three to tenfold, you know, seven twenty-five is like 75 cents. <laughs> right. Right, and they're, only, they're not keeping it up because... Uh, that's not their agenda. Their agenda is um, to tax you more and to inflate more, which is a taxation, so that it gets more money, so that means more control, and that's all it is. It's just a matter of control. Oh, yeah. So the thing is, I think... What, what's actually, usually, from what I understand at least, when, inf uh, when money is printed and, um, and it's actually put into circulation, it takes like a year for prices to adjust. Right. So, and I believe that, I, I mean, I'm, I seem like doom and gloom or something, but I feel like, it's going to only take about one or two months for this to actually kick in. And I only say that because of what I saw today. And it wasn't, it wasn't like a uh, quick spike or something. And, uh, and honestly, it could, like silver, gold prices could t continue to go down. But I think that um, pretty soon these prices are going to hit. Uh, us, well, you know, like, and I'm talking within a couple months. Well, very well could. Um, when when you've got a, a state trying to regulate an economy, it always falls apart. Like, I I can't think of any spe specific historical examples to cite right now, but basically every state economy has reached a breaking point at some point. Right. 
and it either leads to violent revolution or bailouts or whatever. Yeah. There's a few, um, you know, big examples we could use, uh, like the, the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe. That was just inflation. I don't think they actually revolted, but I'm not sure. Uh, Argentina, they revolted after the banks got bailed out and uh, inflation. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, what happens is a deflation and then inflation, and what's going on right now is a deflation. We can tell that by the all, all of these uh, monies going down in price compared to the dollar, you know, mm. uh, and that that's because the dollar is looking strong because you know uh, they you know ramped up all this empire war crap so everybody wants to get behind them and so it, it just seems like a good thing right now but then once the inflation finally actually hits well chickens will come home to roost I suppose as they say whatever that means hmm. <laughs> you know, what does that mean <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, you know, like right now we're just in, in like the pre-bubble, right? Yeah. The bubble's growing, and eventually it's gonna pop. It's not gonna be good. Yeah. Yeah, that's the bubble of the dollar. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. that's a good analogy. Bubble. Yeah. Thought the dot-com bubble was bad. <laughs> yeah. Right. And the housing bubble and all that other crap. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty bad. Um, yeah, so, uh, I might as well just go over the actual prices, um, I'll take five or two minutes to do this. All right. Um, yeah, the last time, uh, we did this show was last week, it was, uh, September 29th, and I took those prices at 6.36 that night, um, tonight I took the prices at 8.38, so last time silver was 17.48, uh, and it's barely changed. It's 1736, so that's a 12 cent change. And that's because, again, I saw silver rise over 30 cents uh, in uh, what six hours or something. I mean, it's not a big big deal yet. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh, gold uh, last time was 121531. Uh, today it was 120668. So that's about uh, a ten dollar change. Bitcoin went from three seventy five thirty six to three uh, three hundred thirty seventy. So that's uh, actually about a forty five dollar um, forty five dollar drop. Um, but yeah, I think this is when uh, things will change. Uh, yeah, better or worse, however you perceive it. I consider all changes good because that's how nature works. It weeds out the, the crap. So um, we'll see what well, happens. Yeah. Um, like as you said, it we it weeds out the crap, and whether that becomes a good or a bad thing depends on how people react. Like, and by people I mean governments, because those are the controlling factors in our modern day uh, dystopia. <laughs> right, but it, it, it's not even that. Like a lot of people do fear change. Like, and what? this is just a natural occurrence, you know. Um, especially as you grow older, you fear change because you're used to some, something. You think one thing. You don't have, or you start to become closed-minded. If you can keep that mind open, you've got a world of wealth in, of information in front of you, and just make use of it. You'll make your life better. And um, don't. It's not good to become too comfortable in a certain situation, right. um, but especially right now, it's good to think ahead and see that the dollar is about to collapse. And if you can see that, then you can prepare ahead. Um, I think it was Corey last time was saying. Uh, he's got survival gear. Um, I don't know if it's just 
um, because he knows that the government's about to die out or if he thinks it's just a good idea in general. Um, but yeah, if you can well, think, think ahead. It's a good idea in general. Um, like, I've got about two weeks worth of canned food stored up and I mean, in a bug out situation, that doesn't really do me much good, but uh, like, if bugging in is a possibility, that's, <laughs> you know, that's a, a, a really good wealth, because not only is that enough food to keep me sustained for like two weeks, I can trade it for the other things that I need, you know. Yeah. Food becomes worth more than gold overnight, and assist, uh, when there is no overlying system of trade or control because you can't eat gold. Right. I, well, I can, but it'll hurt on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> you can sort of eat silver, I've heard. Um, not that I want to. It's freaking metal. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you can get silver poisoning, though. Your, your skin turns, uh, yeah. like, grayish-blue. It's yeah. that's freaking nuts. <laughs> oh man! But yeah, I I think that uh, it still would be valid, you know, uh, to own gold and silver. I mean, you know that plenty of governments have collapsed over the centuries and the oh, millennia. Yeah. So you know, it's still a form of uh, not just currency, but it's actually money. So it would be a good trade good, as Corey would put it. Like, I think that trading would still be valid even after a collapse or something. What? Sorry, somebody knocked on my door. Um, oh, oh. But, yeah, um, gold and silver, like, they are valuable because not only are they pretty, <laughs> but, you know, um, they are very good at conducting electricity. So wow. in our modern world, they have, you know, that point of value. And, I mean, even before the advent of electricity, gold and silver had value because, you know, who doesn't want a gold chair, honestly? <laughs> no, it's more than that, though, because it's it actually stores your value. It, um, you know, it uh, it's small and it can hold a lot of value in a small area or volume, you know what I mean? Um mm. Uh, you know, it's a unit of, of exchange and all this other money stuff. You know, it's not just about the, it being sparkly, I think. Uh, it's well, a little bit more than that. Yeah, that and, you know, humans think gold, they think value. So it's, it's right. got a lot to do with that. I mean, it, it's all subjective, but, you know, more people want gold than, you know, cow dung. <laughs> right. Well, that would still be valuable, I see, but, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't really want to be carrying that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I'll get some uh, cow dung coins. <laughs> they're, they're, they're great for starting campfires. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, just keep it in a piece of plastic, I guess we could still trade it like a coin, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's easily divisible. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> uh, um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, like, uh, that's another thing. Gold and silver, uh, going back to inflation, they, they do get inflated when, uh, you know, their mind, but, um, you know, there comes a time when that's going to cease to uh, inflate. Plus, the rate of inflation as it is now, and I think for the last couple of hundred years, the rate of inflation of gold and silver has not outweighed the population growth. And right. I think that's why the value of the dollar was rising for some time up until approximately 1913. Um, I think that's a big deal uh, and that's why we should be looking into gold and silver as 
currency if we're going to keep a government. Um, but we should also think about Bitcoin, and that's when Corey started talking about J.P. Morgan trying to create a um, uh, competition with them. Yeah. What happened? Um, yeah, I was watching this uh, video. It's uh, called. Uh, it was a TED talk. It's called the Four Pillars of a Decentralized Society, and uh, I don't remember everything about it, but, uh, like, the <clears throat> the first pillar was, like, decentralized information, so, like, the printing press would have been the first, you know, point in that growth, and then it goes to the internet, and beyond that, and then uh, decentralized currency, um, decentralized law, I, I don't remember what the other ones were, but, like, we're we're getting there, like we there's just a few more technologies that we need in place before, you know, government is actually obsolete. Well, that's hard to say though. Uh, I think because we or the centralized government. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's still hard to believe, though. We have this, the greatest empire in the world ever. Like, I'm really shocked we can talk about this on the internet at all. <laughs> I, still, you know what I'm well, saying? What, what could they really do to stop us? I mean, sure, they could show up at our house and black bag us, but, uh, you know, if other people are on the internet watching, they, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Currency of Anarchy, not that we really have that many followers at this point, but, uh, you know, Currency of Anarchy goes off the air. Like, at least ten people would know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's what it is. It, they'd have to block every one of the anarchist stations and YouTube stations and, uh, you know, uh, websites and all this other stuff. There's plenty it, of it. it so many resources to do that because, you know, with, with a medium such as the internet, like, it doesn't take any effort whatsoever to, you know, just just as an example, like, uh, Stefan Molyneux's uh, channel was taken down and it was back up within, like, 24 hours. Yeah. Same yeah. happened to what was, what was that? Uh, Adam? Yeah, Adam Kokesh. Like, yeah. I mean... With a medium like the internet, you can't keep anything down for a very long time. The content creator usually keeps a backup of their stuff, and they can just put it back. Yeah. It's not a very easily censored medium. Right. Yeah, no, it isn't, and that's a wonderful thing. The, the internet really is very anarchist. Oh, yeah, definitely. Anarchy. I mean, just look at, like, the Pirate Bay and stuff like that. How many times have they tried to take down the Pirate Bay? Yeah. yeah. It, it's got to be at least 40, 40 by now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I information is everything. You know, information is the currency of anarchy. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's right. Um, well, Bitcoin is information, man. That's That's what backs Bitcoin. Bitcoin is backed by information. It's amazing. What a what a great algorithm that is. Oh yeah. Right. Want to talk about? Um, <laughs> I'm actually trying to create a um, uh, program that pings a certain source for um, current silver and gold prices. It's in XML data. And I'm just creating a uh, a um, an application that will see this data and take your data, like how many uh, ounces of silver and gold and everything, and calculate the current price. I mean, it's very simplistic at the moment, right. but I think um, I think eventually I'm gonna want to, you know, uh, save some data and uh, you know chart data and create some charts and everything. Um, uh, and that's... 
Right now, I've only worked on it uh, for like a week and a half, two weeks or something. So uh, I want to see where this goes. I don't think it's going to be like the ne next best uh, like Comics or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's it's simple. That's what, what, uh, what, what long-term goals do you have for your your software? Um, nothing right now. It's just for the heck of it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, just... Um, Are you trying to, you know, graph the changes in gold and silver prices, or...? Yeah, probably. Um, but uh, it's just going to take... Um, it's probably just going to ping for, you know... Uh, the last year or something, and then start graphing all of it and making average lines and all this other stuff. Right. Yeah. So, like, you can track, you know, how much the value of the silver you have has changed over the last year or whatever. Yeah. Something and like that. I might, I may, I might put it up on a website and allow people to just grab it and play around. Eventually. Once it's complete-ish. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about um, the military-industrial complex a little bit. Okay. That's uh, a Thomas favorite right there, um, and I'm I'm with him. You know, obviously, the military-industrial complex is um, really sick when you think about it. It's not even so much like they're not doing good at all. No, they're not. All they all they do is promote attacking, and mm -hmm. they're profiting off of it. Um, there, you know, it would be you could almost make a case for them if they were in def defense mode, but they're not. You know, yeah. we've got military all across the world. We've got. Businesses trying to get in and strike deals with the government constantly. Um, it's it's just sick, and they make deals with other foreign militaries as well. You know this industrial complex, not not the army or the navy per se. Right. But so they're funding both sides of any uh, any given uh, conflict. Right. Mm -hmm instances like even even you know quote unquote terrorists in the Middle East you know like they were funded by US tax dollars in the in the beginning because you know the US armed them like the Syrian rebels where'd they get their weapons oh United States um, yeah. Al Qaeda where did they get their weapons oh the United States like well don't you mean ISIS <laughs> they're pretty much all the same. Like they all stem from the same organizations. But uh, yeah, like even even in World War Two, like uh, Red Shield was funding both, you know, the Allies and the Axis, and they were profiting off of you know the suffering of millions of people. Right. And uh, I guess uh, this can still come back to the bankers. You know, this this all is perpetuated because of them. They're making money off of the blood money, really. Uh, the right. more that the government spends, the more that <coughs> are owed, and therefore they're gaining interest on that debt. Yeah. Uh, and all of the money that you know comes from both sides of a given conflict is just extorted from the citizens of the countries. I mean, yeah. governments have no reason to stop this because they have no accountability. Like they could screw up real bad. Who's going to pay for it? Taxpayers. Yeah, they, they don't account for themselves because they want the control. And, you know, we've been in wars ever since 1913, I believe, maybe just right. a little bit of that. Um, I think that 
what they do is they just want the control. They like to instill fear into people to promote that tribalism. It's all it's all under the same. Um, yeah, it, it's just ridiculous. Um, it's all fear-based warmongering, and basically, whoever um, associates with the government has a role to play in the destruction of the United States of America, uh, or destroying us, really, <laughs> us people. Destroying their tax cattle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a vicious game they play. Uh, they're playing with real lives out there, and they're destroying other people. You know, like these fake beheading videos or whatever. You know, it's fake. You know, you, that cannot oh, yeah. be real. Yeah, you know what I mean? It is real. And like that's one person compared right. to millions. Yeah, like you, you, you right. don't right start a war over one death. We should have learned that one, you know, after World War One. But you know, human history tends to repeat itself because collectively, humanity never learns its lesson. At least as far as I've seen. No. Right. Yeah, it does repeat itself. So that's. Um, we have a friend of the show that says, you know, they don't want a uh, revolution; they want an evolution, and I, I buy that. You know, I, I get that. Uh, if we can evolve past government or the idea of such a thing, um, we'll be in a better place. We'll have, um, we'll have a happier society. Is what we'll have. Huh. And honestly, I think it's already happening. Like, society as a whole is evolving past government. Like, within the last 10,000 years, let's just use that as a framework, um, society has become centralized, you know? And um, with, with top-down governments, you know, imposing their will on their people, because, you know, society grew to the point where it needed that. It needed structure that came from outside of, you know, individuals and, you know, small decentralized tribes. And uh, basically, um, like, humanity before, before the dawn of agriculture was just small decentralized tribes all over the world and I believe that we're growing back to that decentralization point through technology right oh okay so you're saying that that's gonna be our catalyst basically like uh, so what you're saying is through the internet which was created in the states if I remember correctly it had to be in the states right right the internet is going to be the downfall of governments, and it's the internet was created in the biggest machine. empire ever. <laughs> well, it, it's one cog in the machine that will destroy the empire. Like, huh? yeah. there's the internet, there's, you know, Bitcoin, you know, whatever else, whatever other technologies that come along, you know, that allow humanity to free themselves from centralized authority and, you know, be their own authority. Yeah, like, uh, there are new modes of transportation coming about right now. Um, <laughs> and we may, for example, I mean, and this is a low-level uh, example, but uh, cars might be able to drive us pretty soon. Right. Uh, I think there are bigger examples like flying cars. That still must be possible right now. Um, it, it, I'd say it's probably possible. I I don't know if it's a good idea. You know, before um, we get to you know the point where 
cars drive themselves. But, you know, um, like there, there's, you know, levitating trains that can break the sound barrier, you know, stuff like that. And, I mean, technology is, you know, growing exponentially. Like, ever since the advent of the Internet, like, Everything had every every technology that humanity has created over the last three hundred years or so, like it, it's grown so much more in these last thirty years than it has ever before in human history. Right. Like computer processors are a perfect example. Like they 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 grow in speed exponentially. Like it, it's to the point of ridiculousness how how much they advance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it will be a uh, great catalyst, like you said, uh, all of these, especially transportation, in my opinion, because, you know, in order to um, flee from um, the military and police, you know, when they become militarized, as they are, um, it'll be necessary for uh, the normal humans of the population to make use of this, in my opinion. Anyway, um, Sheppy, I think we're going to end it here. Uh, All right. Thanks for having, uh, thanks for coming on to the show, and I appreciate your time, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, absolutely. All right, everybody, thank you. Take care.